Okay, we're going to talk about barns in southeastern Pennsylvania. I'm calling that in the book the heart. H-E-A-R-T-H. Somebody didn't know what I meant, heart. It's where, boy, this is something. Why did my knee have to go out two days ago? In any event, the hearth is an area, it doesn't have to be in Pennsylvania, it could be anywhere really in the world, where things develop and they, they gather momentum and from that people migrate out and take those cultural uh, ways and manners with them in some form or another and establish it elsewhere, okay? So certainly the southeastern part of Pennsylvania is a major, major hearth in North America, okay? Um, I'm going to focus mostly today on the area east of the Susquehanna River and south of the Blue Mountain. That includes 11 counties, so that does not include Cumberland County. But since I'm such an unusually nice person, I've included some slides in of Cumberland County here in the talk. I think there's about eight or nine, something like that. Let me see if this a newfangled machine works. It does, look at that. I'm, I'm very impressed. Thank you, Linda. You really did your job. Okay. So, from the earliest recorded history of barns in the state to the first quarter of the 20th century is what we're going to um, follow and talk about. Everybody hear me? Those who do not hear me, raise their hand. Wow, that was good. Okay. So, let's get started. So today we'll see some of the earliest barns in the state, okay? It, it covers a period of about 175 years or so, from about 1750 to maybe 1900. And, oh, that's 150, sorry. From about, to about 1900, okay? And understand that barns evolve. They change considerably. And I am not comfortable. <laughs> Holy mackerel. Well, let's see. This is not cool at all. It adjusts. To get a job? It adjusts. <laughs> it adjusts. Pardon me? Who said that? <laughs> you said that? <laughs> I knew you were a wise guy yeah, when I the, saw you before. The seat adjusts up and down. Really? Would you come up here and do that for me? No. <laughs> Underneath. Look you underneath. know what? I'm, gonna, I'm just going to fight this thing, and if I scream out for help, yeah. then you'll know. Oh, all right. In any event, barns evolved, okay? They certainly were built differently from in the 1750s, the 1790s, even 1800. You would find barn characteristics and traits very different in 1830, 40, 50, 60 than you would have seen 50 and 75 years before that. So they evolved into a lot of different forms, and so we're gonna cover that. You know, it's really interesting, knowing when where to look and how to look and everything. When I started this about 40, almost 45 years ago, I didn't know beans from Shinola. And so it's very interesting how things evolve, all kinds of things evolve. And now I can go into a barn and I still don't know anything. <laughs> no, it, it, it's gotten better through the years, but um, it, it's fascinating. Somebody, I went on a house history um, quote or an estimate to give somebody to do a house history report that I do. And the woman looked at me in the middle of our, our get together and she said, don't you get bored with these old houses and barns? Oh, no. Amazing. I still don't. I'm still excited almost as much as I was from the very beginning. This is a shot of Bethlehem. Who's not been in Bethlehem? A couple, a few, a few of you. All the rest of you have been in Bethlehem. Okay. All right, I can't wander too far away from this because I don't want that lady to get mad at me. She has these uh, penetrating eyes. Did you notice that about her? Really? Holy mackerel. All right, so this is Bethlehem. So this is a scene in Bethlehem about 250 years or so ago. Bethlehem was first settled in 1740. There were 500 acres bought at the confluence of the Lehigh River and the Monocacy Creek. And so this, if you went back about 250 years ago, that's what you would have seen. I'm trying to give you a little bit of a flavor of what landscapes look like. You know, this is, the Moravians were great record keepers. Of all the people in any early settlement areas, the Moravians were probably the best. They were amazing. They even kept records of the cereal uh, brands like Raisin Bran and Kellogg's in the, uh, in their shopping sprees. But in any event, this is the 
This is the Lehigh River. I have to look closer, sorry. Well, I'm not sure where the Gemein House is. I'm a tour guide at the Gemein House. And that was built in 1741 to 1743. And it's about here. But anyway, this is the neck, this is the real um, heart of the Moravian settlement area, okay? Let's go on. Here is the earliest illustration of any barn in North America that we know of. Not a, a physical description, not a, uh, you know, the lengths and the widths and the dimensions and the height and all that stuff. But this is the earliest barn that we know of, illustrated, that I know of in North America. This is a painting, or rather a sketch from the 1750s or so, 1759, as the, uh, as the date up there says. Okay, but this is very likely a log ground barn. Log construction was all over the state prior to about 1770, 1780. There were a number of stone buildings built in the state, like the Rittenhouse home in Philadelphia. And that was built in 1707, so there was stone construction. But log construction was all over the place. How many of you know the, do you have a copy of the, of the Cumberland uh, Barn Book, Cumberland County Barn Book? Because there is, I've seen one, and I have it somewhere. Yeah, there's a, anybody who's interested in that, you know, it, 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 I guess it's still available, I don't know that. But there were log barns built in, in Cumberland County for sure, and there's a number of illustrations or images of these log barns in Cumberland County. So here is the earliest one that we know of right here. Look at the very steep roof. Now, if you said to me, I have a barn, but it doesn't have anywhere near a steep roof like that, I would say that you don't have a probably a pre-1770 barn, because the earlier the structure, the steeper the roof. And there were probably clapboards uh, that were covering the logs one on top of the other. The French have a word for, have a phrase for that. Of course, the French have a phrase for everything. Okay, peace sir, peace, and I'm not saying that right. Peace. How do you say that? Anybody do French? What's the word? P i e c e s u r p i e c e. Peace. What is it? Yes. Say it again. Yes. Yes. P-I-E-C-E. No, P-I-E-C-E. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Anyway, that's, that's a, one log on top of the other. You still find those barns up in, uh, up in Quebec, for sure, in the, environment, the general environs of Quebec. So this is probably clapboards that are covering the logs of this structure here. Okay, earliest illustration, 200, well, 60 years old, give, give or take here. Here's a German house. And this structure right here, everybody see that? You know what? We're going to go to the next slide. See this structure? Right there. That is called a hay barrack. Anybody ever hear of a hay barrack? No? It's a four or five or six posted structure that had a movable roof. So here, they were all over uh, North America. They were in Canada, they were in the United States. I don't know if they were in the eastern and western part of the country, but they were certainly in the eastern part, and I've only ever met two people who ever have seen hay barrack remnants in Pennsylvania, and that was in the 17, uh, 1950s into the 1960s or so. I've seen many of them still standing in West Central New Jersey. For some reason, West Central New Jersey held on to the use of hay barracks. There have been hay barracks, cite, there have been hay barrack citations in Holland Dutch uh, contracts back to the late 17, 1630s. That's 1630s, 300 and almost 400 years ago. So we have that. So that is a very historic style structure. They come, the traditions come from Europe. They're in England, they're in, they're in the Holland, uh, the Netherlands, Germany, Austria. They're in many, many places for excess storage. Of, they say that. I mean, it's more complex than that. But we'll say for our purposes this morning, excess hay crop storage. Anybody have any questions, please ask me. Uh, interrupt me. I don't like to be interrupted. But I have a question. Why does the roof, did you say the roof comes off? No, it goes up and down. And what's the purpose of that? Sorry. What's the purpose of going up and down? For greater crop storage. You don't want to, if the crop storage is very low level, you don't want to have it, you know, 20 feet high. We have records of hay barracks that are up to 40 feet high. So, they have holes, each of these posts have holes every 12 inches. 
And so the, guy, the farmer uses a what's called a template, and he went from corner to corner to corner to corner to raise the roof up, okay? And I would assume that was later and later in the season. So that's why that occurs there. But there's probably, I've spoken to at least eight or 10 farmers who used them back into the 18, 1930s and 40s, and I've probably seen at least eight or 10 of them still standing in West Central New Jersey. What were they made of? What were hay barracks made of? Yeah. Well, they're made of timbers. I mean, the posts were made of, of oak, most often, or hardwood. And the roof plates were made of pine. Now, why would, did you ask the question? I did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So why would the posts be oak and the, and the roof plates be pine? Why would that be? What's your guess? So you can drill the whole thing. I'm sorry? Who said wait? You get the prize. Yeah. Yeah, oak is, uh, pine is lighter. Okay. It's pine is lighter. Okay. And white pine, a white oak, if they use it for the post, what they would do is char the first two or three feet of the post and drive it into the ground. And insects don't like uh, charred material. Oh. Yeah, that's why they did that. That's right. They were smart. Okay, here we have another, actually another illustration of the Crown Point Inn, and that's what this is. This, sorry, this is the this is the Lehigh River. Okay, this is the same barn. Illustration. I think the uh, artist took a little bit of artistic uh, uh, license and varied it a bit. Uh, still in the 1750s. Here, here's the house. The hay barrack, interestingly enough, is not there, but there's the uh, barn, and it came down in about 1860 or so. Lafayette. Um, sorry. Lehigh University is right there. So they needed room, and they unfortunately took that down. Wouldn't that be not wonderful if that could have still been up, and we could have seen that. But you know what progress is all about. And look at the, look at all the surrounding farmland and some wooded areas and everything. Very, very different than what's today. Very different. We've destroyed our cultural heritage. Not completely, but probably by 95%. I've seen records in New York State of barns, log barns in New York State, which are almost non-existent now, that, that they were plentiful in New Paltz in the Mid-Hudson River Valley. I think there's 28 references just in New Paltz, that's just the one town, <clears throat> and there's none that I know that are left. So we've really, really decimated, more than decimated, our historic structure population. More scenes from Bethlehem? Back then, it's truly amazing how much the Moravians uh, saved their, uh, recorded what, what they were doing. So many things. Another shot. <coughs> Barns, that's what we're here for today. Okay, this, we're gonna be, be basically talking, we're speaking about two barn types. Okay, a bank barn, a two level structure, and a one level structure called a ground barn or a Grundeshier in the German dialect, okay? This is the four bay barn areas, the core, domain, and sphere. This black area here is a, a diagonal, a, a basically uh, blacked out area. That is the core. It includes something like 15 or 16 uh, areas. This is a, a map that was ba made by another guy who wrote a book in the early 1990s, and this has been expanded tremendously. Why? Simply because our, our knowledge has expanded tremendously. <coughs> And there is the domain going out quite a bit, going down into the Shenandoah Valley in, in Virginia. And then the domain, of course, is way out here. There have been three or four barns found within about five to seven miles of the uh, uh, Pacific Ocean. So this area, when you go from eastern uh, Switzerland, where the barns were first originated, all the way out to Washington, that's about 6,000 miles or so, maybe close to 7,000 miles, and that's how far these travel in about a 200 year period, maybe 300 year period. Oops, sorry. Again, a Moravian illustration. I went to the uh, archives there about six or seven years or so ago, and I said, do you have any illustrations of any barns on the interior? Now, that other barn that I told you about was not only the earliest illustration of a barn in North America that we know of, this, pardon me, is the earliest illustration easily of an 18th century barn on the interior. So this is something very special. I have this illustrated 
in the book. And I have to tell you, the book is free, by the way. My autograph or my signature is $50. <laughs> no, that's true. All right, so here is the end, end, illustrate, end wall elevation, rather. You can see, now this is a frame barn, obviously. Not stone, it's not log. So they did build stone and log barns and also frame barns in the 18th century. This is almost undoubtedly an 18th century document. We can't prove that. This, of course, here is German dialect terms, which I don't, I'm not familiar with. Here are various areas of the barn. The wagon bay on either side, a, a mow or end bay. Here's the side illustration. The wagons, the loaded hay wagons would go into this area. Here, this represents this area right there. And we have side wall timbers and wall timbers. So this is a frame barn. It's very interesting to me when I found that. And I was really very excited about that. Here again is the German dialect. This another, again is another Moravian building, probably to stable horses temporarily. Why, why people, what, pardon me, wild people went into their church services, whoops, and all that. That is this. And this building right here is illustrated here as far as its floor plan is concerned. Okay, the room arrangements or the area arrangements. All right, again, German dialect there. Any questions at all? Nothing? Okay. I did a, I did a study of what's called the 1798 Federal Direct Tax in Lehigh County. Lehigh County was part of Northampton County, which, which was from Bucks County. Bucks County was formulated in the 1680s, then Northampton County in 1752, and then Lehigh County, what later became Lehigh County, broke off in March of, 19, of 1812. Okay, and here are all of the barns illustrated in my hometown, 235, in McCungie. Who's not heard of McCungie? Yeah. <laughs> Several people. Oh boy. You know what that means? That means Bear Creek, or where the bear are eating, or feeding themselves. Not the Chicago bears, the McCungie bears. <laughs> all right. So here we have a statistical overview of the types of barns. There were 14 categories, okay? Here's the number of barns. So here, with log barns, we have almost 60. Old log barns, we have exactly 60. So I'm gonna go over this really to give you an idea of the diversity when all these tax assessors went around. The 1798 Federal Direct Tax was a result of an impending war, of an anticipated impending war with France that never occurred actually. I mean, the, the taxes were never uh, incurred. They were wanted to raise about $2 million. They went around to 12 or 13 states throughout the Union. Cumberland County was part of it. And they wanted to uh, document all these houses and barns and other feet, not just houses and barns, but all kinds of other structures, OK? So here we go. This, this will be quick. Barns, old barns, log barns, small log barns, old log barns, small old small log barn, <laughs> very old log barn, not a single one, but there were a few townships in, uh, in uh, Lehigh County that did have that. Stone barns, now we get up to a greater number. Stone and log barns, unfinished barns, unfinished log barns, this is my favorite category. Barns of no value. <laughs> Isn't that great? <laughs> what does that mean? Anybody's guess? Frame barns, our old friend the frame barn, James the century and stables. That idea of stables, as far as it relates to the evolution of barns, is extremely interesting. We never focused on that until a few years ago. 235 barns across the way. Now we have, of course, the idea that if you don't have trees, guess what? <clears throat> you don't have barns. Is that totally true? There are actually some buildings in Ireland that are called corbelled structures. Corbel, and the sides of stone go up, and then the roof is formed by graduating the stones up like that. They're staggered, okay? And apparently, and I'm not sure about this, but they, I don't think they have any roof structure per se in that. And how that was held up, maybe by faith. I don't, I don't know what it was. So anyway, I, a lot of time, you know, I deal with a lot of people who deal with houses and barns and things, and very, very few of them are interested in trees. 
and all the characteristics and traits and aspects of trees and what, what went into this structure, what went into that structure. Why did timber framers choose this uh, timber, uh, these species over other species? And there's a whole history of that. I have two chapters in the book about that. Okay, this is a sacred oak. It's a, it's a chinkapin oak. It's a very rare area, a yellow oak, and it's in uh, the Ole Valley in Berks County. It's about six and a half feet across. It was dying essentially for 100 years, and the owner said, I'm going to spend money to save this tree. They had Indian groups where this tree is associated with for, uh, um, for about 200 years or so. They came in, they sang their incantations, and they saved it. And we did a feeding. I didn't attend the first meeting, but I did attend the second meeting. And along the drip line out from where the uh, branches end, we did all these feedings. And the, tr and the th the tree is thriving right now. Look at that great, great uh, root. It's one of the greatest. I have a, a real thing for oak trees. And that is just a monster uh, size uh, root that comes out of the ground, of course. Anybody recognize that tree? Come on. I don't think so. Uh-huh. Monroe Township. I, I can't tell you the township. Now here's our answer. Harrisburg Pike, anybody recognize it? You did. Oh, are you kidding me? What kind of a prize would you like? You get a book. You get a book? You get the book. I'll, no give, you a book. I'll give you a photograph of the book. <laughs> All right, anyway, I wanted to put in a little bit of, uh, of Cumberland County in here so that you wouldn't feel too left out, okay? But wonderful tree. I saw this when I was doing a house history here last year, and I, and I stopped short. People have these signs, uh, I break for barns, well, I break for trees. <laughs> this is the, one of the eight wonders of the world as far as barn architecture, it's probably from about 1800. This is German fock work, or half timbering here. You have posts. You have ties, you have braces, and in between is waddle and dab. okay? It's called fock work. It goes back to ancient times, okay? This is a real, real rarity, whether these barns were built, now this is in New Jersey, okay? That's in central New Jersey, in Somerset County. It's in a, a somewhat very limited uh, German settlement enclave there, but outside from that, it's German, it's, it's uh, sorry, Holland Dutch. Anybody have a, a spare $300,000 that they just don't like laying around? They get fed up with, just, with all this money around? Please give it to us and we'll restore this barn. We need about $300,000 to restore it. Right now, it's all buttoned up. It's illustrated in the book. Uh, but it has some very, very early features from even before 1700. And why somebody came over to Somerset County, the Duderstadt family, in uh, around 1800 or so is anybody's guess, but it has a fantastic structure, and it's a real, real rarity. There's a few of these uh, buildings out in Wisconsin, I believe. Excuse me. Yes. What did you, what did you call that in between the timbers, the, the white? Waddle and Dob. Waddle and Dob? Yeah. And what is that? They're, well, they were actually a comedy team like uh, Alex and Stella. Yes. <laughs> it's Waddle and Dob. It's, it's horse hair and plaster, lime base, and all that, oh, okay. that they bring okay. together. Yeah. And that was used a long time ago. This is one of our earliest barns in all of Pennsylvania. It's in Montgomery County. It's probably about 15 miles or so from the Delaware River. And it is dated 18, 1761 in Montgomery County. This is the Heckler barn. It's a ground barn. It's not loud. We'll get into the uh, uh, four bay, two level barns in a little bit. But here we. Any questions? All right. Um, here's the wagon bay. On a on a ground barn, a one level ground barn, you your your wagons, your loaded hay wagons, go go in on the one side on the eave wall and have uh, the contents unloaded, and then go out the other side. You can't do that in a four bay barn, in a bank barn. I actually know of two barns that were like that. That could you could they actually had a bank on one side and a bank on the other side. You go in have the contents unloaded and go out the other side. I'd never seen that until about five years ago when I did the countywide survey. But here, 
We have the wagon bay, then we have a stable area, in this particular case, cows, and then horses on the other side, and then the mouths with the ventilating uh, splay loop holes up above. Okay, so basically, one of the definitions of a limiting factors of a ground barn is that there's no floor level below the wagon bay, and that's right here. So there's no basement, there's no full basement. You can consider this a basement here and over there maybe, but not under the wagon bay. So that's considered a ground barn, and that was the probably most likely the first barn that was in the state back in the 1640s or 50s or 60s, most likely in law. And here we have another ground barn built in the 1780s probably. Look at that steep roof, that steep roof aspect that I mentioned before. Look at this interesting uh, demarcation line of stone right here in line with the eaves. Look at that. I've seen a number of barns like that. Sometimes they have very uh, distinct or separate or segregated uh, colors of the stone. And why that is, is anybody guess. Okay, but this again is at a strictly English uh, settled spot, not a German settled spot, but it has a German legator stool, which we'll see it's a roof structure, and that's what that article is in um, on the on the, cat, on the uh, counter there. Now this is a different style. This is English based. It's not German based. German Grundischer. This is a Lancashire style barn, and one of the uh, contributing factors to that are these three doors. On a German barn, you would never have three doors at the, on the end wall here. But here we have a footer gong or a feeding aisle, and you can go on either side to feed the animals. On this side, it's the horse side. I'm sorry, the cow side, the cow side. It should be, but th that's a confused area. We'll, we won't get into that. In any event, there's three doors, and you won't see that on German barns, but you'll see that on English. Yes, sir? Are the slots in the side for ventilation? Yes. And also, what, what, what were they also for? Shooting. To take aim at marauding Indians. Mm -hmm. That's not true. <laughs> <laughs> I just made that up. But yeah, they're for ventilation. They, they vary by a factor in their height of two to one. Some of them are as low as, as about 18 inches. Others are over three feet long. <laughs> and they're medieval structures that have these balustradia or these splayed loopholes. They're very narrow on the outside, about four inches or so, and then they spread out on the inside about 18 to 20 inches. So, so you, don't want, you don't want a 20 inch space exposed to the weather, but a four inch space is not gonna make that much different, difference. Here we see the inside of the barn. Now, horses would trod around, the theory goes, horses would trot around a grain that was dropped out onto the wagon floor and it would separate the seed from the chaff. All right, but it would need an extra space. This is an alcove right here. This is about a four, four and a half foot wide alcove. The wagon floor is right here, and then the mouse stead wall is right there, the mouse, of course, being on the other side. But this is the this is a spectacularly different style of swing beam. One of the earliest swing beams that we know of anywhere in North America. You'd have to have support somehow above without any obstructions, no posts, no studs, no braces or anything. And we'll see a couple, uh, a few other examples of that. But this is a swing beam. Swing beam concept, series of cantilevered beams, your joists. But this is the only one where the swing beam is supported by these cantilevered joists on the one side. So this is really rare. This is in Berks County, east, uh, let's see, I guess pretty much east of Reading in Berks County. Okay. Anybody recognize that barn? Is the owner of that barn here? This is just off Wordsville Road. It's in Enola. It's in Enola. Uh, there's a date stone. I'm sorry, well, there is a date on the stone right there. We can't, we can't see it right there, but it says 1842. And I did this barn history last year. And the owner was surprised for me to tell them it's probably 1870 to 1890, and there were some telltale signs about that. This is a four bay, a standard barn, a standard barn as opposed to a Schweitzer barn. Standard barns have asymmetrical roof lines. Schweitzers, which we'll see in a little bit, have asymmetrical roof lines. What's very rare about this barn, although it may be fairly um, prevalent locally, is that you have a drive-through wagon bay here 
But all it's open. It's all open. It's completely open. It's open here, of course, on the side. And in the back, here's the four bay. It cantilevers over the stable wall, the recessed stable wall. So this is one of your barns here in Cumberland County. It's not a very early one. I think some of the earlier barns in the county may go back to 1780, the log, of course. 1780, maybe 1790 or so. <coughs> and here, of course, is the back of the barn, the rear of the barn. In Ohio, this would be considered the front of the barn. So we're different. Here in, in Pennsylvania, we almost always call this the rear of the barn. In Ohio, that sound, that's not a good sound. You better turn it off. You don't want the guy in the front to get upset. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Are you a doctor? They should be here at this lecture listening to us. Thank you. All right. What we have here is pretty unusual in our area in southeast Pennsylvania, at least in the greater Lehigh Valley. We have this protection or canopy over the two wagon doors, both leading into a wagon bay. So here you have the end mount, wagon bay, wagon bay, end mount, or bay. And it's all original, all the way across, about 70 feet. And here you have the basement level here. And on the other side, of course, this is the approach uh, ramp to the barn. Now, this is really unusual. And we'll see this a little bit. I don't have too many interior uh, illustrations here. But here we have what's called a post to Perlin construction, post to Perlin barn. Okay? They're only occasionally seen in my area. They're out there, there are a few dozen of them, but they, they were built much more prolifically um, west of the Susquehanna River. It's a later adaptation to certain barn um, economies, uh, farm economies, rather. And what's unusual about this is that most often, apparently, in your area, they have the built-in ladder rather than centered on the bend of the framing unit. It's to the side there. It makes sense because you have that, you have that structure right there. And all you have to do is put your, your rungs and the other side studs to make this built-in ladder. It goes all the way up to the roof. Okay, So that's, that's pretty unusual in our area, but not so unusual in your area. I have a question about I'm sorry? We had more trees. You had more trees? I think so. Who said that? I did. Who did? <laughs> you had more why, why would you say that? Trees. Yes. Right. Trees. Why, why do I say that? Yeah, I'm just interested. The mountains. I can come close to guaranteeing you that, that Southeast Pennsylvania had ever bit as many trees as you had. Okay. Not to get into polemics with you, but yes. No, we, there, there were trees all over the place. Okay. I'm not saying it was 100% from, from uh, stem to stern, from the edge to the edge of the state. That's not true. In fact, in the country where I am, they think that there was a lot of a scrub oak. And scrub oak is like a pioneer species. But that's another story. Now, the reason I have this illustrated here. Can I ask you a question about that ladder? Why, why is it going up to the second level? I don't see a floor or anything there. So what purpose is it? Because, don't forget, hay was first put into the barn. And you'd have lower levels, middle levels, and higher levels. So that access, I mean, just because they used, when they would use the built-in ladder, they wouldn't use the entire length. But there was no floor. It doesn't have to have a floor. But we did put floors in there later. later. Yes, that's yeah. right. Yeah, yeah, very often they did that. Oh, that was the later, the second floor. floor. Oh. Yeah, it's a little bit. I, I get it. Okay. It's a little bit like a hay barrack. I mean, you don't use the full height of it. So, yeah, I mean, that's a good question. But anyway, that's pretty much the answer. The reason why I have this here is because, like I said, barns evolved and everything. There would be much smaller log barns. And then later on, they would build bigger barns to account for the changing economy. Pardon me. <coughs> so what this, rep what this represents, that notch, is that these logs, I don't know how many there are here, but very often, not very often, fairly often, uh, even in my area, they, and this is the barn, the same barn in Enola. This is the stable wall right here. And the, these are the cantilevered uh, ceiling joists in the basement. And they would extend out about six or seven feet in this particular barn. They would just take, they would knock down an old barn and just recycle the timbers. Why not? If they're there, they can use that. And that's what they did. So here's the notch where the, where the timbers came together at the corner. That represents corner notching. 
right there. And the owner never saw it. That's okay. That's why they hired me. Now we get into our first German style four bay barn. This is a Schweitzer barn. What makes it a Schweitzer? Well, I'll tell you since you asked so nicely. This is a, it has an asymmetrical roof line. Look at that. It has a regular part, the stone, which has a symmetrical roof line, but then the added four bay. It was added originally, it's not an afterthought in most cases, but that's what defines a Schweitzer. The Schweitzers came in probably as early as about 1740 or 1750. There's a long history of that. We have that uh, discussion in the book. And here are our friendly uh, splayed loopholes again. There's all kinds of arrangements of this. There's one over two, over three, over four, over five. Here's a one over two, over five, over four. So there's all kinds of uh, variation and combinations of these splayed loopholes, okay? Here we have the porthole at the top, very steep roof, built in 1784. One of the earliest dated Schweitzers in the entire state. But the, I should tell you now, the holy grail of all Schweitzers and even, I'm sorry, the holy grail of all barns, German-based barns in North America that I know of is in Franklin County. It's in a place called Welsh Run and I was out there for the first time I think seven years ago. And I was astonished. So many of the barns are original on the upper floor, not all original, but they're much changed in the basement. The basement in this barn was actually more original than the upper floor level. It was probably somewhere between 90 to 95% original. And, I, and it's in the book, I call it the holy grail of all German structures, not just barns. So you have that here in the west part of the state, or the second part southern uh, central part of the state. Okay. We're looking at the other side. Here's a, here's a ladder. Not so much building, probably not original. That's pretty steep. You better not be drunk when you're going up there. <laughs> in any event, a lot of the barns did have this feature. It went from the ground, of course, in front of the stable wall right here up into the uh, forebay right there. This is the back of the barn, again with the splayed loopholes. Here's the wagon bay. This, bay. this barn is about 65 or so feet long, uh, maybe 70 feet long, somewhere along there. It's a three bay structure, wagon bay, end bay, or mow, and the same on the other side, okay? And here we see some of the interior of the barn. This is the four bay. This is the four bay right here, going from that front stone wall there to the very front wall of the barn. That's the four bay. It's a short one in this barn. It's only about four, four and a half feet deep. I've seen them as little as less than three feet. I've seen them as much as about seven to eight feet or so. Excuse me. Yeah. It's a, a common feature of German barns to have fancy chandeliers in them. <laughs> we always get one person like that in the <laughs> and, and you let this guy in? Why? <laughs> okay, here we have a, our friend, the swing beam, right there. Swing beam. It makes you see things better, though. I guess. Anyway, this is a swing beam, different than the other one, and it has this alcove of about five feet or so. The horses, again, trot around, and uh, this is tulip wood, not oak, not pine, but tulip wood. No braces, no posts, no studs underneath it. The horses would swing a wide arc on the wagon floor. 1784. This is the mousestead wall on the one side, all original, pardon the intrusion of the modern materials. Now I want you to look at this little spot right there. Right there, and two more slides. Here we have the front of the barn in the four bay area right here, and the rest of the barn back here. This is the swing beam that joins to the stone wall at the front. And of course, a pocket was created in order to insert this timber. And here we have just the opposite. It goes from the very front wall of the four bay back into the stone wall, so it tied everything together. What did they use the four bay for? Good question. They, asked, they used that for the general storage. Maybe not the earliest of these four bay barns were, were uh, established for granaries because the granaries were actually in the house, the garret of the house. 
And you probably had many houses here that had that situation here. Up until probably around 1790, maybe after this, until after the uh, Revolutionary War era. And general storage, granaries on the one side, that kind of thing. There it is. Isn't that sweet? That's called a pintle. This, this is the pintle right there. Look at that very sharp edge. And then the pintle support. If you see a pintle support on, on a house or a barn, it's probably of the 18th century. But look at this fine, that's 18th century uh, craftsmanship right there. Original mousehead walls. Mousehead wall. Anybody recognize that? I don't know what road that is, but I took it last year. Here we have Schweitzer's in Cumberland County. Whoops. Stone to the eaves level. So the earlier style of Schweitzer's had stone at the peak. And again, that was an evolutionary thing. Okay? And later on, they started to build uh, Schweitzer's with stone to the eaves level only. Not only, but to that point. After about 1800, 1810 or something like that. And here's the front floor. But this is a pretty good shot of a Schweitzer in Cumberland County. This is a milk house. This may be a corn crib. I'm not sure. But here we have, instead of the split um, uh, vertical slits, we have louvered windows. And louvered windows came into the scene about 10 to 30 years after the display loopholes were utilized. <coughs> now we get back. I'm going in some kind of a, a chronological order here. This is in Bucks County, only about two miles or so <coughs> pardon me, from the from the Delaware River. This is a ground barn on the, on the uh, 1798 Federal Direct Tax. Here we have a mow and a stable below, a mow and a stable below, Wagon Bay. But then, about 1830 to 1860 or so, the roof was raised, changing farm economies about four feet. So whether this, this raising of the roof occurred at the same time that this frame addition or section was built, uh, we don't know that uh, especially, but this barn was probably built around 1790, but it's a rare log barn. Log barns were all over the state early on. And now uh, in 20, I'm sorry, in 43 years I've been coming to Pennsylvania, I've lived here since May of 2000, I've only ever seen 22 barns, uh, uh, ground barns that had log construction or frame construction or log and stone construction, only 22 and there were thousands. That shows you the attrition of our, of our cultural heritage. Enormous loss in the last number of years. Enormous loss. Here we come to a 1790. It's dated, of course. There is the date stone with a German dialect inscription, an invocation to God or Jesus to grant good the luck or good fortune to the farmer and his, and his buildings and his, and his barn and his farm crops and his uh, farm stock. One of the best date stones I've ever seen on the exterior of a barn anywhere. Here again is the loophole. That's a circular loophole and these are the vertical splits. Okay, And here we have limestone, they, the builders in the central part basically, uh, the central third of, of, of uh, Lancaster County had great access to limestone. In fact, that's supposedly why the Mennonites went where they did in 1709, 1710, because of these great oak forests, these great white oak forests, white oaks that were up to three to four feet in diameter. Okay, and then recently, actually, I asked where was the nearest uh, gravel pit or pit or area that would have promoted that would have uh, yielded these. Um, uh, what, not limestone, yeah. brownstone. And they said about three or four miles away. So they had to have this source of, of uh, brownstone, of course. And of course, it was an accentuation. And it just made it prettier. And everybody was happier. <laughs> there we have the German roof structure, a Ligandestuhl. It goes back to about the 1380s in, in German uh, settled areas, Austria, Switzerland, and Germany itself. Okay, we have over there. We have multi, multiple level buildings, uh, three or four stories that have 
only what they each have a linear short loop structure. I'll explain that in a minute. Okay, so here I've only ever seen one, not multiple ones. So here we have a principal rafter system of the Ligeter stool, Ligeter dock stool, lying chair or roof chair. Okay, so it's inclined, of course, because it's a rafter. It's wider at the top than it is at the bottom. It's about six inches or so at the bottom, maybe 12 inches or so on the top. Why would it be wider at the top than at the bottom? Any, any guesses? Anybody? Because you have this purlin plate here. You need a socket here, and it receives the purlin plate. This purlin plate is halfway up the roof line, and that's the main support longitudinally in the barn. So here we have that uh, much wider thing. I've seen a house with 12 or 13 inch wide. It was a small house at the Burlet Farm. Talk about overkill or overengineering. We also have a strain beam going to the opposite uh, principal truncated uh, rafter, a collar beam, and an end brace. So we have all these features of the leading machine. And they are found in mills, barns, houses. There's even a charcoal house where at the Coleman place uh, near, I think it's in Lancaster County, very close to where it joins Lebanon County. Now, that's a German roof structure. This is an English roof structure. Here we have a principal English-based principal rafter system, where the principal rafter goes from the wall plate all the way up the entire height or length of the roof slope on each side of the barn and ends there. We have a collar beam, a stout collar beam. This is actually in a 1790 or so. I'm sorry. Standard rafter system. Well, okay. It means a standard rafter system in barns of that era, 1790 to 1830. It's actually in the in the uh, Sauken River Valley near where I am. It probably goes up to about 17, 1850 or so. All right, anyway, we have the pearl and plates here. Those are sectioned, unlike the leader stool, where they go more or less continuously, not all the time, but here they're sectioned. And this is in a log Schweitzer, okay? Here we have one of the best, most wonderful Schweitzers in all of Pennsylvania. This is the Bertlett Barn, 1787, right here. A Schweitzer has an asymmetrical roof line. Here, it's the front structure, not in the back. Uh, splayed loopholes. It has so much originality in, in, in the inside and the outside. You can go on and on. He could have talked just on that for an hour or more. On the outside, on the uh, rather to the rear of the of the Schweitzer area is a standard barn, which we'll see in a little bit. That has a symmetrical roof line, but look at the, the roof is not quite as steep. And that was built exactly 30, uh, 50 years later in 1837. So here you see, right after the uh, Revolutionary War. You see how the Schweitzers continue to be built as they had been for 30 to 50 years or so. And then much later, in 1837, there's a stone, a date stone, that shows uh, this uh, later style standard bar. Can I get some water? <laughs> Thank you. What were the original roof materials? It could have been thatch, or it could have been roof shakes. Not red tile. <laughs> so that would, that would require constant maintenance of that, wouldn't it? It would. I think they wear out 25 to 30 years. Oh, wow. Yeah. But they would be thick and basically not a drop of rain or snow or anything would, go, would fall into that. I mean, they knew what they were doing that way. One time, a guy, a hobo, or somebody came along and they wanted a night's sleep in a barn. This is a very cool story. And they, um, so they said, sure, they had dinner, and they went out, and the next morning, the guy who slept in the barn overnight was, um, he had set the end of, they were putting the thatched roof on, and, they, and, and he set to fire the end of the roof. And he thought he was burning his barn down. But what they apparently did was they took, took a snap line of some kind and stretched it all the way across the barn and they may have part of the story not exactly right, but they stretched the line all the way across and they would set it afire in, in a very particular way so that it would only burn up to that point and not beyond. Wow. So he thought he was, his barn was being set on fire, but it wasn't at all. 
I'm sorry? flipped a couple slides. Thank you. I'm sorry? Your slides slipped ahead while you were talking. Oh, thank you. Thank you. See, I'm really enthusiastic about this, aren't I? <laughs> Maybe that's not a good spot. Maybe it is. All right. Um, again, the uh, Berlitz Schweitzer has another swing beam right here. Wagon bay, an alcove of about six feet or so. And again, the uh, swing beam is of tulip wood, not of pine, or certainly not pine, but of oak. Okay? Har hung door at the end, it pivoted. Instead of being a swing on, on pencil, on, uh, sorry. Hinges. Hinges, thank you. On hinges, it, uh, it had a pin at the top, right about here, and a pin at the bottom, one into wood, one into stone, at the back, and that was the pivot pole. And they're very ancient. They probably go back to 1100 A AD, 1200 AD, maybe even before that. It was very ancient. But we've only found about six or seven of these har hung doors anywhere in Pennsylvania. I don't know if we found it out here in Cumberland County or uh, Franklin County. This is a real rare uh, feature. It's called the Stick Balkan. It's about a two foot long timber. It receives the rafter, the common rafter. This barn has a leader stool, by the way. So the rafter comes all the way to the roof peak, all the way down. It's received into this Stick Balkan. And the um, bottom part of the Stick Balkan Received, is received into the uh, wall plate. Now this is a metal plate. Its face is at this, at this uh, vantage point and then it's twisted 90 degrees. So it's received here and then turned 90 degrees to be received on the timber below. So it's a very, and every single, you can see it faintly over here and every rafter, there's probably about 25, 28 rafters or so that have these uh, plates all attached to the common rafter. Okay? The only one that we know of in North America that's built prior to about 1850 or so. A guy up in, New, uh, rather in Massachusetts was all excited about it and I told him about it and he said, send me a picture of that and I'll do a little bit of write up and put it in the Timber Framers uh, publication. And so they did and he was really astounded. It's not that unusual in Europe, but here it's extreme. It's Extremely rare. Here we have a very rare hexal comma right there. Straw, straw room. Okay, this is all original. This is a trap door here. It has Moravian-like hinges. It's opened up, of course. It has a an original staircase just below that. So you ascend the staircase, open this up, and you're into the forebay of the barn. Here's the back or the rear stone wall. Here's the hexal comma here. It's very rare. Whether how common they were back 200 years ago, I don't know. There's two barns in Franklin County that have hexal commas. And other than that, there's very few that I've ever seen. And here is the original uh, plank staircase here. It's quite eaten away by animals and the like, up to about maybe five feet or so, maybe five and a half feet here. It's pretty much untouched. But that's a real rarity. I'm sure it's the earliest surviving four bay staircase anywhere in the state. Here we have a point of my most current study as a sprinkle bar. <laughs> <laughs> sprinkle means bar in German. So when you say sprinkle bar, you're saying bar bar. <laughs> when I want to have my hair cut, I go to a bar bar. <laughs> anyway, this is the stable wall door frame here. This slides in and out in a box set in the stone. And there's a ring, of course, to, to grab it and pull it across, supposedly at night, to keep the horses in. I'm doing a long article I just sent out on, the, uh, on my e-letter, a, uh, about, a, about a 15 page article on on security bars. I'm calling it, it's a lump sum term called security <coughs> bars. And, and, and uh, Spriggle bars are one of them. This is 1787, so Spriggle bars came in at least in, in the 1780s. 
Are they European in origin? I only know of one in Europe, and that's in Slovenia, and a house, not a barn. So there probably is no direct connection. They could be. We've lost so many things, and, and to make connections, who knows what went where and why and when. Standard barn. You can't see the roof structure here, but it's symmetrical. It has louvered windows and an 1805 date. This is the feeding alley, and this is the end wall, of course. Feeding alley or footer gong, and this is the state, the horse entry um, to the horse stable area. And here we see this is one of the great structures as far as internal uh, timber framing is concerned in any barn in Pennsylvania. This is a very, very rare king post. You have queen posts on the side in many other barns, but this is called a king post. It usually starts at the upper tie beam, which is about here, but there it goes, it passes through the upper tie, the lower <coughs> partial ties, down to the swing beam. Here we see another barn made with a swing beam. And this is the cantilever here to create the alcove below. This is a six and a half foot wide alcove for the horses again to try around. And here's the top of the swing, the top of the king post with that metal reinforcer plates, double pegged at the top. These uh, junctures right here are called joggles. Joggle top end king post. Okay? This is a barn in Lehigh Valley. And probably built around 1800, maybe 1810. When I first saw this barn in 1997, I said, well, there's an accommodation of some kind. I had never seen the intrusion, so to speak, of frame or rectangular uh, framed areas in an end wall, even a eave wall. And I thought this was an afterthought. Well, within about three or four years, I saw that eight or ten more barns, even standard barns, that had this feature. So whether that was an access point for the introduction of hay into the upper loft area of the barn or not, I have no idea. But it was a tradition, wasn't very widespread, but it did exist. This again is a Schweitzer with an asymmetrical roof line, a very short four bay. It's in the Jordan Creek area in uh, right above uh, Allentown. Only about three and a half foot wide uh, four bay. So here we have another type of two level bank barn with an upper floor level and a lower floor level. This is the basement, of course, with all the stable doors. These are not original because they rotted out. Unlike a four bay, this barn style, which came, which originated from the, the northwest part of England, the, the Lake District, had a pent roof. And it went across the full length of the barn. And it had these pent arms, but they would rot out after a while. And there are a few, there are only a few left that have that feature. This, of course, rotted out. But unlike the four bay barns, you have stone in most cases of the English Lake District barns going from the ground all the way up to the E level. Okay, this is probably about a 1790 to 1800 barn. This is a standard barn, a symmetrical roof line right around the corner from me. It's not there anymore, but it had a principal rafter system. End wall door with a, with a real nice canopy at the end. This is a log and frame standard barn in Northampton County. Logs at the front here. Very rare barn. Schweitzer's not so rare. Log construction and standard barns are very rare. <coughs> and here we have two barns only separated by seven feet in Upper Macanji, north of me by about three and a half miles or so. A, a Schweitzer <coughs> and a standard barn. 1810, 1840, give or take. And here is a barn that's 116 and a half feet long. They, they would not allow, it's three sections though, a middle section, an end section, and an end section. Guy didn't want that barn to be put on the tour. Much later standard barn with a symmetrical roof line, about 1860, a frame construction. Uh, the inside of the barn, of course, with a built-in ladder here. It goes almost to the roof peak and it's centered. All right, but here's an offset. So it goes up to the upper tie, and then it's, you step over, and to send those other three or four rungs on the side. That's pretty unusual. Usually they go straight up, sometimes all the way to the roof piece. And here is a guy who put his name 
He wanted to be immortalized. 1862, Mr. Eisenberg. Another barn of about 1870, give or take. That's in the Perkyonenville area of uh, Montgomery County. Very small standard barn. Here's a much later upcountry posted barn that's original. A lot of times after about 1880, 1890, they attached, whoops, they attached uh, front straw sheds here to the main body, uh, barn part, the main barn section, and they called it a upcountry posted barn. Upcountry posted barn. This is an original. It's only one of three that I know of. Here we have marriage marks where the timbers came together. And this is a 1907 dated barn, a, a posted standard barn. Even though this, this barn was built 18 years after my grandmother was born, uh, it still had all the typical features, the basement with the stable areas, a wagon bay, and, and mouths, uh, everything. Mouse walls, granaries, everything. So that tradition of maintaining all these features well, went past 1900 easily. And here we see a barn star. And that was probably a good uh, 110 years old from the inception of the barn. A rosette here, which is very common on uh, barn stars with the outer band. A much later barn, about 18, 1930, uh, where basically the vernacular expression went out and it didn't exist too much. Maybe they got tired of it. I don't think they got tired of it, but they just needed a much more expanded uh, uh, framing technology and size technology than they had before. This barn, I think, is 125 feet long. A lot of graffiti and marks and carvings and such on all kinds of original wood, uh, wood elements. Uh, the mousestead wall, the granary board, the granary door, all kinds of things. There's thousands upon thousands upon thousands of these carvings. And if you wanted to devote your life just to the carvings on Pennsylvania barns, you could do it and never finish. <laughs> chestnut. Who knows a chestnut leaf? The chestnut, of course, is very common until about the 1920s, and it started, it didn't start then, it started before that, but the chestnut disappeared. And this is a metaphor for all, so much of our early vernacular architecture. And why are we here today? Because we remember. Thank you, everybody, for showing up.